Um, okay, everybody, let's go ahead and get started. Um, today, um, uh, it'll be very interesting. We have Fred Singer here in the flesh to talk to you. Um, so I'll introduce him in a minute. Okay, all right. So um, without further ado, let's get to the main event today. And, and um, so I'll tell the class. So, uh, so Dr. Singer has agreed. I think he's going to talk for about half an hour, sort of what we said, maybe more, maybe less, and sort of give his... His, you know, I actually don't know what he's going to talk about. I think he's going to talk about merchants to doubt a little bit. Maybe he'll talk about some stratospheric ozone. Um, I'll be as surprised as everybody else. Um, and so he's going to talk. And then after that, um, you guys can ask questions. And, you know, again, this is a rare opportunity. I think I do, I, I'm not exaggerating when I say Dr. Singer is a figure of historical importance. Um, people will be studying what he did for 100 years. Um, and, um, you know, and so I also have the question, so we also put together a bunch of questions for you. So you guys can ask extemporaneous questions, uh, or we can start going through the questions that the class put together um, in, our in our brainstorming session. And we can just sort of see, see where it goes. Um, but it'll sort of be a free flowing. I have shrewd bucks for particularly good comments. Um, the other thing I'll say is, um, um, you know, Dr. Singer doesn't hear as well as perhaps you and your friends do. So uh, you can ask me, I'll repeat questions for him. Um, and, you know, just make sure you speak up loudly so everybody can hear. And um, uh, maybe don't, don't interrupt Dr. Singer during his presentation. Sort of write your questions down, and we'll have questions after he finishes. And then we'll sort of have a free flowing discussion but sort of moderated by me, just so I can repeat the question. And that's also important because I'm recording this, so I, I want to get sort of the questions on as well as the answers. Um, at least I hope I'm recording it. I'm, I'm never actually sure. Uh, I will say, how many people saw the presentations yesterday? Is anybody? So a few people. Okay, so we, we videotaped that. So it looks like about a half a dozen people were. Uh, so we videotaped that, and uh, maybe we'll be able to make that available. Um, do you object to putting it online, the video, the video of our presentation? Do you object to putting that online? No. Okay, so I'll put that online for all of you guys, um, and um, you know, take take a look at that. And I think that I think it was that was a very uh, interesting and useful exchange. Um, and so, all right, so let me introduce Dr. Singer. So um, first, let me say I left my notes up in my office. So correct me if I'm wrong. But um, he was born in Austria, and um, he emigrated to the U.S. Um, right around the time Hitler was invading Czechoslovakia. So is that right? But, give or take, give or take. Um, so then he went to Ohio State, and he got a, a bachelor's in electrical engineering in two years. So um, is, that, that's, is that correct? Yeah. So I think that's a testament to he's smart. And uh, the Austrian school system, I think, is probably pretty good. So uh, Austrian, high, Austrian high school students know their math. Um, and then he went to work at, at Princeton and got a PhD in physics and has since had a long career in magnetospheric physics. So my father talked to the class and, and gave some background about his background and talked about how he knew you. So he interacted with my father in the 50s and the 60s on magnetospheric stuff. Fred was... Um, uh, Dr. Singer was a, um, had, had a long career there, and then he switched into the government and uh, um, had a long career in various government agencies, uh, National Weather Service, Department of Transportation, things like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you guys, after, after hearing um, so much about, about Dr. Singer in various classes, feel like you know him already, so I feel like I probably don't need to give too much of an introduction. But uh, nonetheless, it's, it's a great pleasure to introduce Fred, and uh, let's have a round of applause for him. And again, I'm, let me just put this on. We're going to record this. There you go. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yes. Good. Uh, thank Professor Dessel for inviting me here. I'm very pleased to speak to you. And very pleased to be on this campus. Small correction about my biography. I never went to high school. Uh, I left school at 13. I apprenticed in an optical machine shop. Uh, on the day that Hitler marched into Czechoslovakia, I crossed into Holland. And from Holland into England, and I worked in Northumberland which is in the far north of England, as an optician. 
I came to the United States to join my parents who had emigrated here in Ohio, and uh, I was fortunate enough to be accepted by the faculty at Ohio State without a high school diploma. So I'm grateful to them, to the state of Ohio, for what they did for me. I should mention that I enlisted in the Navy when I was uh, 18 or 19 and uh, interrupted my education for a short time. It would have been longer, except we won the war very quickly after I had to, not to <laughs> anything to do to me, of course. But uh, uh, the Navy discharged me, and I went back to school and got my PhD. Uh, I'm supposed to say a few words about uh, a book that's been published by a lady at uh, the University of California in San Diego who calls herself a historian of science or a scientific historian. I'm not sure which. She's neither a historian nor a scientist, in my view. Uh, and I, this book attacks mainly four people. Three of them are deceased. They're all friends of mine. They're very distinguished. I'd, say, I'd like to say a few words about them before I get started. First, William Nirenberg, fellow physicist, a little older than me. He uh, became the director of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and had a very distinguished scientific career. As far as I know, he was on the same campus as Oreskes, but I don't think they ever spoke to each other. Uh, the next one is Robert Jastrow, another physicist, even more distinguished than Nirenberg. I knew him, I've known him since he got his PhD in nuclear physics. He then went to Holland and worked in Leiden, came back, became a space physicist at the Naval Research Lab, published many, many books, popular books on astronomy, very profound books, worth reading. He founded the Goddard Institute of Space Studies, which is now in New York City, and run by James Hansen. Uh, he was a good friend of mine. He died after a long illness. And finally, the most distinguished of all of them, Frederick Seitz, older than all of us. Uh, he was uh, also a physicist. We're all, we're all physicists. And uh, he got his PhD at Princeton also with the same professor I did but much earlier. Uh, he is the father of what you call solid state physics, which produced transistors and everything else. All the marvels of modern electronics uh, are, come from solid state physics. I'm not saying that he invented them, but he wrote the first textbook on solid state physics. He became the president of the American Physical Society. He then was elected president of the National Academy of Sciences and then became president of Rockefeller University. He has, I don't know, 30, 40 honorary degrees. Oh, the White House gave him the National Medal of Science. So he's extremely distinguished. I just want you to know who these people are. I'm proud to be in their company. I'm the only survivor, and I think it's my obligation to defend their reputations, which are being attacked in this miserable book by Naomi Oreskes and her co-author, whom I don't even know who he is, and I've never met him. I would like to imagine Oreskes standing here and being subjected to you as questioning her. The first thing I suppose you should ask her, are you really a historian? I mean, do you follow the uh, precepts of historians? Have you ever interviewed any of the four people? And she would say, no, actually, I haven't. Well, how do you know about them? Well, I got second-hand or third-hand reports about them, and I do a lot of reading. Okay, that's very nice. 
but Nuremberg was on the same campus. Have you ever talked to him? Well, not that I recall. Have you ever talked to Jastrow? No. Have you ever talked to Seitz? No. Well then, as a historian, you really haven't done your due diligence, have you? Well, she says, I have a lot of footnotes. That's nice. A lot of endnotes. If you look at the book, you will see that there's a great deal of endnotes, which makes it look very scholarly. But unless you do direct interviews with the people that you are writing about, you really haven't gotten anything. And then I would hope that you would test for science, because she also uh, purports to be a scientist. And uh, I suppose one of you would ask her, now in your book it says that the pH, the neutral pH is 6.0. Do you still stick with that? And she would say, well, that's probably a misprint. We didn't catch that in our proofreading. And you'd ask her, well, what is the uh, proper pH for uh, neutrality? And she said, well, probably somewhere around 7, isn't it? And I'm not sure she knows exactly what is meant by pH, or how to measure it, or its significance, or what is acid and what is a base. And then I suppose you would ask her, okay, somewhere else in the book you say that beryllium is a heavy metal. Do you still stick with that? And she would say, well, it's heavier than lithium, isn't it? Yeah, but what about uranium? That's a really heavy metal. And you would ask her, what's the atomic number, atomic weight of beryllium? And not sure she knows. Because if you write down the atomic weight of beryllium, which is 9, depending on the isotope you take, 8 or 9, uh, it's a, obviously much lighter than any of the other elements in the periodic table, except lithium and helium, which is a gas, not a metal. Then you might ask her about her explanation of the greenhouse effect. Somewhere in the book it says, the greenhouse effect is produced when carbon dioxide is trapped in the lower atmosphere. Oh, trapped in the lower atmosphere? How do you explain that? I don't think she has an explanation. I don't think she knows what the, what the greenhouse effect really is. But the one I really like in her book is her explanation about the effects of smoking. Now, we all know that smoking is a very dangerous habit and that there's a strong correlation, statistical correlation, uh, which is so strong that it's almost a certainty that there's a correlation between direct smoking and lung cancer. And her explanation of how that is, comes about is as follows. And you should ask her about this. She says, that in the tobacco smoke is radioactive oxygen-15, an isotope of oxygen. And that's what causes lung cancer. Well, oxygen-15 certainly is a radioactive isotope of, of oxygen, but it has a lifetime of 122 seconds. How does it get into the tobacco or into the cigarettes. Why doesn't it decay away? So there are a lot of questions you could ask her, but I suspect that what has happened is that she has confused radioactive ox oxygen and reactive oxygen. They do sound alike, don't they? And, but it's very different. So you might ask her to explain what radioactivity is and ask her to explain what is meant by reactive oxygen. Well, in a nutshell, I'm not impressed with her scientific knowledge, nor am I impressed with her historic expertise. But she styles herself as a scientific historian or history of science specialist, and she has a professorship in this field. She is now 
been advanced, and she's now a provost at, at her university, spending her most of her time away from the university, traveling the world on different campuses, lecturing about her book, and throwing dirt upon uh, Jastrow, Nuremberg, Seitz, and Singer. Well, that's very nice, but I would like to know who's paying for this. I'm sure, I hope, that she pays for her own travel expenses, but I think, I have a feeling, that her salary is being paid by the California taxpayer. And one of these days, they're going to ask questions. How did we spend our tax money, and what did you do for the university while you were traveling? I've had my say on this, uh, and I've asked myself if I should do something about her uh, book. And you know, there are friends of mine who've advised me to sue for libel. I've been through one of these libel suits. I won. Uh, but it took a lot of time, and it means you can't do anything else while you're tied up in a lawsuit. It takes a lot of your time, and it also takes money. You have to pay lawyers. And it's quite expensive. And the outcome, supposing you win, what does it get you? Nothing much. Uh, you, you can sue for damages, but then you have to prove that you've been damaged financially. That's very hard for me to do since I'm retired. So I've decided to spend my time uh, not suing, but instead I thought I would write about the book, and I've produced some little essays. I think you've read one of these that appeared in The American Thinker. It talks about uh, uh, passive smoking, secondhand smoke, environmental tobacco smoke, and so on. You may have read that, and I'm happy to answer questions on it, of course. Uh, I'd like to be able to be a fly on the wall or sit in the audience when she speaks next. I hope she comes to this campus. Has she been here? Maybe you should invite her and, and prepare a set of questions. I will gladly help you <laughs> uh, and see how she reacts. Well, I will certainly let you know. I would, love to have, I would love to have her talk to the class also, but so far it has not worked out. Unfortunately, the book has had some impact because people, many people believe what's in the book because it looks scholarly and she has credentials, on paper at least, uh, and, uh, but to me, uh, the book is basically polemics. She's demonstrated that she's an expert polemicist, that she is a good propagandist, she knows how to promote her own work, and I've concluded there's no substance to it, but it, it does deserve attention, and I've tried to give it attention by uh, using ridicule as much as possible. I think humor wins out in the final analysis. And there are enough mistakes in the book so that one can practice humor on it. I've been allotted 30 minutes. It's now 15 minutes. But I think I can, I can, I'm happy to stop at this point, take questions, and probably we can elaborate as I answer the questions. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, do it one. All right, give this one. All right, well, thank you very much. So, um, I guess to begin with, does anybody, before we get sort of our list of prepared questions, um, does anybody have anything they want to ask Dr. Singer based on his presentation? Jeremy. And I'll, I'll just say, uh, ask a question, I'll repeat it. So, go ahead. Okay, uh, first off, we appreciate you coming here. Uh, the presentation yesterday was great. We, we all really enjoyed Opportunity to uh, present a libel suit. What points would you sue based on? I mean, 
mean, obviously you can't sue somebody because they say the pH is six or that the oxygen isotope is causing cancer. Which points specifically in the book do you feel apply to you as liable? Oh, interesting question. Okay, so first of all, he said thank you for the seminar. He said it was the best seminar all year. I, uh, that's uh, that's not a very high bar to cross, frankly. But <laughs> but we but we we appreciate it. Um, appreciate uh, yeah. So the his question was about the libel suit, and um, specifically, you know, uh, um, you you can't sue somebody over saying the pH neutral pH is six. Um, so what, what would you think is an act, what a actionable items are in the book? Or, uh, I can hold it. That's the question? Yeah. That's a good question. I, I, I would have to uh, I reread uh, much of the book to, to find actionable items. Uh, she accuses us, all four of us, of being motivated to do what we're doing by, uh, believe it or not, anti-communism. That's not actionable. I mean, uh, uh, I'm not sure that we, uh, I think all four of us could call ourselves conservatives, and we probably are against communism, uh, but we've never articulated this jointly. Um, so I don't know how she concludes this. But if you read the book, you'll find that she calls us cold warriors, all four of us, anti-communists, and she says that is the root reason why we are uh, against, uh, and then she lists all of our sins, uh, acid rain, nuclear winter, uh, global warming, uh, ozone depletion, uh, secondhand smoke, and so on. It's weird. It really is weird. Anyway, it's a very good, very good question. Um, I'll just add, um, in case you hadn't seen it, but you know they've done multiple printings of her book, and now I have not seen one, but the students tell me in the latest version it has the correct neutral pH, and I also think they've taken heavy metal out of in front of beryllium. Is that right? So that doesn't say heavy metal beryllium either. So so uh, that's been that's been erased in the latest editions of the book. They read uh, my essay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's right. Um, all right. There are other uh, other questions. Is, is oxygen oh. fifteen still in the book? Yeah. You know, we should talk about uh, actually. Let's talk about oxygen fifteen. So I have a question about that because you know I actually had the graduate students in the class. There are six students who are in 689 grad level, I have them look up the various things. And I looked it up myself. And actually, I don't think it actually says what you said it says. It doesn't, she does not say that it's oxygen 15 that causes cancer. She's quoting sites who said that there's oxygen 15 in the air. She, in fact, his point was even air has carcinogens in it. Even air has oxygen 15 in it. I don't recall that. Well, right, it's can, worth checking. We can check that. I don't recall that. I think it's her doing. Uh, and she says the auction 15 is in the tobacco smoke. But I can reread this section, and just to be sure. It's, it's been se several years since I've looked at it. Uh, if you can understand that I don't really enjoy looking at the book. <laughs> and, uh, I, can, I can understand that. Um, all right, so while I'm doing this, other um, other questions? For you. Yeah, Cam? It seems like um, he mainly discussed small facts and merchants of doubt rather than the big picture about uh, the public being confused on scientific consensus. So I wanted to know what he thinks about if the public has been confused about the scientific consensus around the issues that were discussed. All right, so the question is, um, um, uh, most of your criticisms are about uh, what, what Cam characterized as small facts, which I think is probably not an unreasonable way to describe it. Um, do you know, what about the bigger issues? Do you think her, her you know, can you comment on whether her bigger issues about, about creating doubt in the public's mind? I mean, what's your reaction to that? Because that's really, I mean, these other things I think I would characterize as not terribly important. Just, I mean, you could take all of that out of the book and the book remains basically the same. 
But, but I'd be interested in your comments. What's, what about the bigger narrative? And hold it, hold, hold that. Now talk. Uh, Seitz, Nuremberg, and Jastrow uh, were members of something called the Marshall, George C. Marshall Institute. I'm not a member. I had no, no direct connection with the Marshall Institute at any time. Um, the Marshall Institute published one of the early discussions on global warming and uh, uh, put forward the idea that most of climate change is due to solar variations, natural variations, and not to carbon dioxide. That was published, what, uh, 20 or more years ago? Obviously, we know a great deal more now than we did then, but there are still many, many people, including myself, who believe that the sun has a strong influence on climate change. So uh, what they published was not out of line with what we know today. I don't think they published it in order to, uh, as it were, throw doubt on uh, anthropogenic global warming, but that was their honest opinion based on scientific uh, studies, uh, partly on literature surveys and partly on their own studies. Jastro actually published papers on the solar effects on climate, so they were some of his own studies. Uh, Seitz, as far as I know, did not publish on this. He was already in his 80s by then, so uh, he was not actively working in science anymore. But Jastro did publish on this, so I think uh, they simply agreed with his arguments, and that was the reason for the publication of this book by the Marshall Institute. I don't think it had any ulterior motive, uh, but uh, I think that uh, Oreskes suffers from some kind of persecution complex. Obviously, she has different complexes, but that's one of them. And she feels that uh, this may have been the reason why they published the book, to throw doubt on the, on the story of the IPCC. Okay, so actually I found it, believe it or not, um, the internet's amazing. I actually found the page in the book. And so this is the, this is the page where she talks about oxygen 15. Um, so, Fred. Fred. Oh, okay, read online. And, okay, okay, read online. All right, so what, it's, what it says is, sites saw irrationality everywhere from the attack on tobacco. Blah, blah. After all, the natural environment was hardly carcinogen-free, he noted. And even the oxygen in the air we breathe plays a role. And then he talks about oxygen 15. So I think this is what she's talking about. I, I, you know, I, I looked pretty carefully through the book after you sent me the critique. And I, I really, I couldn't find any place where it talks about her saying cancer from smoking is due to oxygen 15. Uh, could you send me this? I will check it when I get home. It's possible that they've changed it since in a, in, in a subsequent printing. No, I have, the, I have the original edition. Mine has the pH 6 and the heavy metal beryllium. So I, I'm pretty sure I have the original well, version. All right, well, all right. We'll, look we'll, 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 we'll take this under as a to be resolved. To um, so be resolved. To be resolved. All right, um, uh, other questions? Come on, guys. This is, you know, it's like Johnny Football <laughs> squared here. So this is your <laughs> chance. Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's a uh, yeah, it's a good question. So, uh, did this book come out when Jastrow, Seitz, and Nuremberg were alive, or were they all passed away when this book came out? Um, I'd have to check. I don't remember. So, so uh, you never talked to them about the book? I never talked to them about okay. the book. No, right. I never talked to them. I know that. I never talked to them about the book. Uh, I did talk to Jeff Kutter who is the current president of the Marshall Institute. And he has written, I think, a very good summary of the situation, which I sent to you. Yeah, they, they, read, they read that, or they should, I should put, they should have read that. Yeah. Um, OK, good question. Other questions? Uh, yeah, Abby? So is there anything in the book that you do agree with, but you think is accurate? 
She's good. All right, so uh, her question is, is there anything in the book that you agree with her on, uh, Oreskes on, and Oreskes and Conway? <laughs> Uh, yes, there must be something. Let me see if I can find it. Um, you know, there is one very interesting thing. Uh, I don't think she realizes this, but of course I'm sensitive to it because it concerns me personally. She talks about the work we did on acid rain on behalf of the White House. There was a panel formed chaired by Bill Nuremberg, and Bill, being a friend of mine and knowing that me, uh, put me on the panel. I may have been the only, uh, how shall I put it, uh, I was not involved in acid rain in any way. I didn't have any money writing on it. I had no research contracts and so on. Some of the others did. Uh, some of the people depended on uh, research grants and contracts for their work. Acid rain was a big, big issue around, let's say, 1980. Do you remember that far back? Uh, I have a vague memory, so I'm sure the, most of them weren't it born, was the were biggest, not born. It in was 80. the biggest issue in the environment. It was causing all the trees to die everywhere. Do you remember uh, a German expression called das Waldsterben? The, the, the Germans are very sensitive to their forests, and they were afraid that all their forests are going to die. Wald means forest, sterben means to die, so the dying off of forests. And there were papers published in newspaper articles about the dying of forests in Europe, in Germany. Nothing like that ever took place. It was all a hoax. They've now discovered it, and they've written about it. But at the time, it was one of the great emotional issues in the world, the acid rain problem and the dying off of the forests and the acidification of lakes and the dying of fish and all these things. So uh, uh, you anyway, oh. I would like to just, uh, in, 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 in this panel, the panel was set up by the White House in order to deal with an issue that the Canadians had, had raised. They claimed, the Canadians claimed, that acid rain from the United States, that is from coal-fired power plants emitting sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides, containing, acidifying the rain, that this rain was hurting their forests. And this became a big international issue around 1980. And the White House was sensitive to this, and they, they asked the panel to look into this. And the panel looked into this, and uh, uh, that's described in the book. And then I was on the panel, and there came the question of what to do about the acid rain, what to do about the emissions of sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides. And I came up with an interesting idea. I don't think it was novel, but I, it had not been discussed much before. I said, why not have emission trading? Why not have those who can easily afford to control the emission of sulfur, do this, and sell permits to those who have uh, costly problems. And the idea was very simple. If metal smelters like copper smelters and nickel smelters, which emit uh, tons of, of sulfur dioxide, would control their emissions, uh, then the utilities, electric utilities, which emit rather less and find it very expensive to extract sulfur dioxide from the smoke stacks, they could uh, not have, well, they wouldn't have to do anything. They wouldn't have to spend any money. So those of you who are trained in economics, this is essentially constructing a supply curve. It means doing the low cost things first and then doing the high cost things much later. It makes sense. It's obvious. I was roundly denounced by the rest of the panel and says, how can you suggest that? It would let the utilities get away with doing nothing. And I pointed out that this is a lowest cost solution to the problem. It's called cap and trade. It's come back into vogue. 
And Oreskes accuses me of doing this because I wanted to protect emitters <laughs> of sulfur dioxide. And the panel wouldn't accept my suggestion, and therefore she describes how uh, Nuremberg solved the problem. He said, well, let this be an appendix to the report. Fred Singer can sign the appendix if he wants to, but it won't be the report of the panel. The panel doesn't recommend it. It's only an appendix. So that's how it was published. So now I find that, according to Oreskes at least, I'm the originator of cap and trade, uh, which has become very popular uh, in relation to carbon dioxide. Right. All right. So I'll, I will now call it Fred Singer's idea. So that's uh, pretty strong. All right. Uh, but uh, actually, your your answer gave me something I really want to ask you about, and that is: so you called uh, uh, acid rain a hoax, and you know, hoax has all of these connotations of intentional, and or at least, yeah. I mean, I think intentional. I mean, if you say it's a hoax. Somebody did it on purpose to fool us. No, is that no, really what you think? No, no. No, acid rain is a real problem, or was a real problem, but it's not a very serious problem. Well, then, do you think using hoax is the right word? No. Hoax is not probably not the right word, but, you know, this is a matter of uh, semantics. Uh, uh, I don't think there was any premeditation here to fool the public. Uh, uh, Acid rain was uh, considered to be a problem. Uh, in, it led to legislation. By the way, there was an acid rain study, which was authorized and supported by Senator Moynihan. And Senator Moynihan was very disappointed with the outcome of the study because the study concluded that it wasn't a big problem. But he accepted it. And the, the study led to legislation. And the legislation uh, enforced a limit on C SO2 emissions, on sulfur dioxide emissions. As soon as the legislation was passed, and before the action took place, which would take decades to put into place, the problem disappeared overnight. That tells you something. It tells you that the proponents of acid rain control really wanted to have legislation passed. And after that was done, they were happy. The problem had not, has not gone away. Acid rain is still a problem. And still, uh, SO2 is still being emitted from places around the world. In fact, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere creates acid rain Slightly, slightly acidic, carbonic acid is slightly acidic, not as, not as acidic as sulfuric acid or nitric acid, different pH values. Anyway, the uh, problem uh, is to some extent settled, to some extent not. Right, okay, but so let me follow up on your statement that it's a matter of semantics. Um, uh, it absolutely is a matter of semantics, and, and again, I don't want to argue I'm, uh, I'll be, I'm trying to be neutral in, in right now. I don't want to argue Oreskes' case, but if she were here, she would probably say semantics do matter, and calling it a hoax is a semantic argument to basically introduce doubt. I mean, what you gave following that was a really nuanced, much better answer than saying it's a hoax. I mean, there's, you know, it's, you know, it's, there, there's all sorts of sources and blah, 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 blah. Uh, I mean, so what, what, what would your reaction be if, if she were here and she said that? Uh, as far as I know, the word hoax is used primarily by Senator Inhofe in talking about global warming. I've never used that word. I wouldn't. It's not, it's not uh, the way I discuss the subject. Uh, I happen to think that many of the proponents of global warming or alarmists are wrong. I don't call it a hoax. I think that most of them are honest believers that this is a serious, serious problem. There are a few who have ulterior motives. I don't want to identify them. I don't think I can identify them. But there are always a few like that in any any group of people. OK, uh, excellent. Um, I just try to move it around. So I'll, if no one else, I'll call you Jeremy. Uh, Manny? Uh,
what you need to find this, you only need a bachelor's of science. Is that enough credibility to to say that this is what people believe? Okay, so the question is um, the Oregon petition. Um, so we saw, we watched a video on YouTube of you giving a talk uh, some years ago, and you talked about the Oregon petition. And um, in order to sign the Oregon petition, you have to have a bachelor's degree in science. And so the question is, is that, uh, you know, what is it that, what do you need to have to have a credible opinion about science? And do you think the Oregon petition is a credible um, counterpoint to the IPCC or to, to an expert organization like the AGU or something like that? Um, the Oregon petition is not a scientific, in, uh, it's a petition. It's not a scientific paper. Uh, it's not a scientific effort. Therefore, it is not an argument against the IPCC. Uh, the argument against the IPCC, I tried to give it at yesterday in my presentation. Those of you who were present, I don't want to repeat this, but uh, there is a group called NIPCC, which is much smaller than the ma uh, number of people who signed the Oregon petition. And we are uh, climate scientists. Uh, most of the people who signed the Oregon petition are not climate scientists. But that's all right. There's 31,000 of them. They are qualified scientists in some field or other. Okay? And they are mostly U.S. based. So they're a small sample. I mean, do you think calling them scientists, though, is an exaggeration? I mean, they have a batch, most of them, the majority of them have a bachelor's degree in science. I believe they do. I'm not uh, involved with the Oregon petition. Uh, this was originated by Arthur Anderson in Oregon. Art Robinson. Uh, Robinson, sorry. Thank you. Uh, in, in Cave Junction, Oregon. Uh, I think it's in southeastern Oregon. Um, uh, he's a very he's distinguished biochemist. So I don't consider him a climate scientist. Uh, he originated the um, Oregon petition, and it was signed eventually by 31,000 people, more than 31,000, of whom I am told one third have advanced degrees. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. David, do you want to raise your hand? You look like. Yeah. All right. All right, so the question is, in your uh, talk yesterday, you were talking about the tropical hot spot, and you said that during the second assessment report, the IPCC messed with the data. And, you know, that's a very, I mean, that's, among scientists, you're essentially accusing other scientists of yes. fraud. Yes. I mean, would you, re would you uh, stand by that statement? Is that really what you meant? I didn't call it fraud, but I stand by the statement, of course. And do, you, I, I, do you think it is fraud? You didn't call it fraud, but is it uh, fraud? Ah, uh, I don't know. I can't read people's mind. All right. Uh, but I can I can verify that the text had been changed from the draft final approved draft to the printed version. Number one, I can testify to the fact that one of the graphs in the crucial chapter on attribution has been doctored, that is changed from its original form, and I can testify to the fact that the data have been selected in order to turn what is really a decrease into an increase. In other words, you can always take a section of a climate record, as you well know, and produce a decrease or increase depending on the interval you choose. That's exactly right. All right, but I have to be honest. I haven't followed all the, I remember the 1995 issue when it came up. I was doing stratospheric ozone, so I didn't pay too much attention to it. Uh, but my memory of that was that, you know, you know, drafts change. 
that's the whole reason you have a draft. You have a draft, you get comments, you change. And I'm I talking think about the, the final draft. But, but what, the, what the, the authors responded to, and this is my memory of this at least, is that they said that they were responding to comments, that people made comments, so they changed, um, they cha you know, they changed it, in res but they were following procedures. Is that not, do you disagree with that explanation? Partly. Uh, let me tell you exactly what happened. I was there. I was in Madrid and I was in Rome. In Madrid, we approved the final draft. And we also, the delegations from some 200 countries, approved a summary, line by line, a very tedious affair. The draft was approved by the scientists, the people who wrote the report. The summary was approved by the national delegations. After that, between Madrid and, and Rome, came the directive from up above, apparently, and I do have a copy of that letter, saying make sure that the report is in agreement with the summary. So the report was changed after the final version, uh, and uh, we know who made the change. He has admitted it, and it has been documented in Nature magazine, and also in the Wall Street Journal. But just for the record, um, it is also true that, uh, I can't remember who, but a, a bunch of IPCC people got together and said that, that what he did was not um, against sort of IPCC regulations. I mean, there wasn't, it wasn't, the, the case was not the case that the bureaucrats decided what the answer was and the scientists had to change it. It was not that. It was that. that you think that's all right? It was all right. that. Okay. Well, we'll. I have a letter. Maybe I'll have. Maybe for extra credit, I'll have somebody uh, uh, dig into that and see if we can uh, track that down. So that'd be an interesting. It's not interesting a bunch report. of IPCC guys getting together. Uh, it was uh, the direction of the IPCC, which was under the direction of Sir John Houghton at the time, directing Ben Santa to make the changes. Ben Santa at that time it was a very junior scientist at Livermore National Laboratory, but he made these changes, he made them very skillfully. He took out the phrases that, in the report that said we don't know what's causing the warming. Uh, it didn't say it is not human, but it, say, it said we cannot say for sure. And he substituted the phrase, uh, the balance of evidence indicates a human contribution. That's his phrase. Well, that was the that was the SPM's phrase. That was the that, the that, SPM that. depicted it first, and then I, I agree. I think that probably did get propagated backwards. But I'm not sure that disagreed with what they had originally. It's just different words. But it, said it disagreed. Same. All right. Okay. Well, it disagreed. Okay. All right. Um, other. I mean, it's between yes and no. <laughs> That's a disagreement. Um, all right. Other questions. Um, Jeremy. Yeah, Dr. Singer, you had the. Uh, Yeah, okay, so uh, this is a question referring uh, to your paper with Roger Ravel. Could you basically um, give us any insight into what Ravel thought and maybe why he had changed uh, previous views? Surely. First of all, just to correct something, Roger never changed his previous views. He's always been skeptical about the extreme alarmists on global warming. We know this because he gave interviews to Omni magazine. We know this because he wrote letters to his congressman and to his senator expressing his views. And that was long before he did the article with me. By the way, there was a third co-author, Chauncey Starr, uh, who is a nuclear physicist and nuclear engineer, uh, who contributed a great deal to the paper. The paper was published in a magazine called Cosmos, which is read by maybe, I don't know, a few hundred people. Is that the Cosmos Club yes. newsletter? All right. It goes to members of the Cosmos Club, and it doesn't go anywhere else. No one took notice of it. The way it came to attention, to public attention, is of an enterprising journalist, the name of Easterbrook, 
who found the paper, and Al Gore was running for vice president, and he's, he published it, and Al Gore was claiming that Roger Revelle was his mentor who introduced him to the science of global warming, which is true. Uh, he was his, he took a course from him at Harvard, or maybe he sat in on the course. I don't think he took an exam, <laughs> because if he had, he would have flunked it. But uh, uh, he, he was claiming the mantle of, Al, of Roger Revelle, and it was kind of uh, uh, disconcerting to see a publication by his mentor, quote unquote, uh, which said that global warming is no big issue and we should uh, take our time and study the subject uh, for at least a decade and make sure that the models agree with the observations before we do anything drastic. Uh, that is what provoked it, the whole thing, and then one of the uh, Revell students decided to uh, libel me, and I, I was forced to sue him, and I got him to withdraw his uh, libelous statements and apologize. I didn't get any money out of it. I wish I had, but he had no money, so we couldn't get any money even if we wanted to, even if we could show that we'd been damaged. So the whole thing kind of petered out. Okay, unless, does anybody have any pressing questions? We can go through a, sort of our list of prepared questions. We have about uh, 17 minutes. So um, we have some, I think we have some good questions. Um, all right, Jeremy, last, last question from the audience. Um, I just have one question. You know, I, I look at these two sides, and emergence of doubt, I see this big narrative of a number of scientific consensus Um, wow, that's a long question. I don't know if I can. I don't know if I can repeat all of that. Um, uh, so basically, um, so maybe I'll just do the very last part of this. I mean, do you think that that um, your giving, going out and giving talks about this book is going to be effective in counteracting the influence of the book? Good question. Uh, answer is I don't really go around talking about the book. I was asked to talk about this book by Professor Dessler. It's my first talk about the book. The first time I've talked in public about the book. Um, okay, good. So let's go to, um, um, we'll go to our list of questions. Oh, hold on. Uh, Professor Dessler mentioned AGU and asked whether the Oregon petition disagrees with the AGU. The AGU has just come up with a statement about climate change, which I consider to be horrible. Uh, it turns out uh, Jerry North, Professor North, is chairman of the panel. I met with is, is in our department. Yeah. I met with him this morning, and uh, he told me that as a result of my objections to the AGU statement, the panel has discussed the matter, and there are two panel members who disagree with the statement as it stands now, and they've revised it. I'm waiting to see the revised statement. Right, so it's a draft, right now, just to let you know, so the scientific societies put out statements on things, so the American Geophysical Union um, drafts a writing committee, they write a statement about stuff of importance, so scientific, statements, scientific societies put out these statements all the time. And so climate change is obviously a contentious one, so they put together a draft, They've been circulating a draft, and you know these things are written by committee. So um, you know we'll see what we'll see what comes out of the committee statements. So let me go around here to the PowerPoint. And, um, okay, so um, uh, nine. So, so this is the question. So in 1995. 
you characterize secondhand smoke as a myth. I mean, that's actually the word you used it as. We, you guys put out a press release on environmental myths uh, in 1995, and it was listed as one of them. Uh, what are your views today on secondhand smoke? Do you think secondhand smoke is a carcinogen? How would I know? I'm no expert on, on cancer, and I don't know what's in secondhand smoke. I'm not a chemical toxicologist. All I know is this, and this is what is in my report, which was published, I guess, around 1992 or 93, uh, that the EPA, in writing their report about the effects of secondhand smoke, fiddled the numbers. And I can show this. They, in other words, I do know some statistics. So that's all I've used here. I show that they have moved, in fact, they admit they've moved the confidence intervals. They've moved, they've also used what's called a meta-analysis. They've neglected what is called publication bias. And furthermore, they have, arrived at a risk factor which is well below what any epidemiologist would consider to be reliable. So, uh, in other words, the report of the EPA on secondhand smoke is, uh, you can call it a myth, I call it a fraud, uh, you can call it whatever you like, I call it, it's wrong. But there, there were other reports. You know, the National Academy put out a report in the mid-'80s. I mean, taken so, – so you can criticize any single thing, but when you put them all together, do you really – do you, was, was there doubt, and I guess there still is doubt in your mind, over whether, whether secondhand smoke is dangerous. Is that right? You still aren't sure whether it's dangerous. Well, uh, my view, personal view on secondhand smoke is that it's a nuisance. I don't like it. It bothers my eyes. It makes me cough. And I cannot imagine that it's healthy. But I can assure you that the EPA analysis, which comes up with 3,000 lung cancer deaths a year in the United States, that this analysis is wrong from a point of view of statistics. That's all. Yeah, but that, that doesn't, I mean, you're sort of avoiding the question. If you look at all the reports that are written, all of the stuff, not just, I mean, maybe that was a crappy report, I don't know, but, but certainly. There, you know, the National Academy had a report that came out several years before that, and they also, I can't remember what they said, but I think they said for young and old people, it was, I mean, there were slightly different conclusions, but, but still. You better remember what they said before you quote them. But, well, no, I, I know, I, well, well put, well put, but I know that they said it was bad for you. I don't remember, it was some qualified conclusion about it was bad for babies and for old people, but maybe not for, it was, I can't remember exactly what Look, the wording was. But. I believe that. I'm sure that it's bad for you. But can you show that it produces 3,000 lung cancer uh, okay. deaths a year? All right. So, okay. So, uh, that, uh, that leads us perfectly to our next but question. No, 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 no. I'm not finished. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> there are two other reports that you need to know about. There's one by the Congressional Research Service in 1995, Report 1115. I know the number very well. 1115. You can look it up. You, you can Google it. Congressional Research Service, which looks at the EPA study and arrives at the same conclusion I did. You get ab then about the EPA study. I'm not finished. All right. Then there's a report from Judge Osteen. And again, you can Google it. O S T E E N. It's a judicial study, 84 pages, I believe in which he comes up with the same conclusion I have some years later. So I'm independently confirmed that the EPA study is bunk, just bunk. It is garbage. That's all I say. Right. I don't say it's fraud. I don't say it's myth. I don't uh, advocate for secondhand smoke. I certainly don't advocate for firsthand smoke. I'm a non-smoker, I've always been, and I, I don't think I'll change at this stage. <laughs> Um, okay. All right, all right, but the, you made a really interesting point. So, okay, so let's stipulate to your statement that the EPA report is, is incorrect in some way, okay? Uh, yeah. But you also said before, you said you don't have any question that, that uh, ETS is bad. I don't. So then do you think that, uh, that your, your speaking out against the EPA report was helpful for society? Because, I mean, you, we, there's the stuff we know is bad. That's an interesting question. And you're, yeah. That's an interesting question. 
uh, speaking out against the EPA, I don't think I, it got any any publicity whatsoever. I don't think society gives a one hoot about what I said about the EPA. But uh, it's been held against me uh, because people don't like my views on global warming. So uh, Oreskes, for example, tries to discredit all four of us by linking us to tobacco. What does tobacco have to do with global warming? Nothing. Uh, but it, it, it establishes doubt in people's mind about our scientific reliability. Well, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, I think she does a disservice to society by doing this. Well, I mean, uh, so let me play devil's advocate for a second. So your, your our argument is that nobody really listened to you about secondhand smoke, but there are no. documents in the tobacco legacy library they got from from all of the lawsuits over the tobacco companies where a lot of this stuff has come out. And they say in there that they're extremely happy with your performance on this. This is from Brown and Williamson and how they were arranging for media interviews for you and you're doing, uh, and so you did a big media, when you released this press release about Ms. you did this big media study. And so, I mean, and they were arranging for media interviews for you. I mean, does that? Well, I have to be, I have to tell you something. This. What you say is correct. That this was actually written. This was written by Flax. Do you know what a Flax is? They make their money uh, doing public relations for the tobacco industry. They have to show their bosses that they're doing good. So they exaggerate. They arranged no media interviews for me, as far as I can recall, and that they had made never any impact. They said they were going to. That's their business. They never told me. Okay, fair enough. All right, um, moving on. What are your views today on ozone depletion? So uh, today, knowing what you know today, do you think that the scientists in the late 80s, early 90s got the, not, we're not talking about UVB at the surface. Let's ignore that. Let's just talk about just stratospheric ozone depletion. Do you think that w the physics that they understood then is, is correct? The physics has changed. The physics, original physics, uh, I'm going to be a little technical, it was based on what are called homogeneous gas reactions. Um, this explains nothing about the ozone depletion, or very little, because it only works at the upper stratosphere where there's very low ozone. The really effective ozone depletion occurs through heterogeneous reactions on particles. That's why you see ozone depleting particularly during uh, or following volcanic eruptions. Now, uh, my own view on ozone depletion is, yes, it has depleted. Uh, we, we, we have the data. It shows a depletion at mid-latitudes of around 4%. Compare this with the predictions of the National Academy in the 1970s, before the the Montreal Protocol. Have you looked at their reports? They predicted up to 70% depletion, 70%. Where did they get these numbers from? Well, a committee got together and said, well, um, maybe these reactions will do this, maybe they'll do that, maybe they'll do this. Let's say 70%. They were, they, had, they were required by law to submit a report every year about their predictions on ozone depletion. So they predicted up to 70%. The final word is that the, the depletion that actually took place is 4% between around 1980 and 1993. This is in the WMO report of 2004, and I've quoted it. 4% is a sizable depletion, measurable depletion. Uh, you need to compare it to uh, ozone changes that take place naturally. Do you know what the ozone changes today here in College Station from day to day due to weather systems? Of the order of 100 to 200 percent. Do you know what the seasonal change is between spring and fall? Of the order of 30 or 50, 40 percent. Do you know what the 11 year solar cycle change is globally? About 3 or 4 percent. So a 4% depletion is certainly measurable, but it's, you know, it's not 
something to get really excited about. Okay, so let me let me interrupt you right there. So uh, I, I'm not going to necessarily disagree, but this is this is a classic issue of of what's happened now versus what happened in the future. So Paul Newman at Goddard and Rolando Garcia at NCAR have both published papers about this world avoided. And we actually talked, we spent two lectures on ozone depletion. So these guys, you guys better know gas phase versus heterogeneous chemistry for the exam. Um, so you should have understood exactly what Dr. Singer is saying. Um, uh, and what they say is that had we not phased out fluorocarbons, maybe it's only a few percent now, but by 2050, at this exponential growth, we would have wiped out, you know, two-thirds of the ozone layer. And, um, you know, I mean, do you, again, sort of going back there, do you think that, uh, well, this is sort of a slightly different question. I mean, do you think that their calculations are right? I have not looked into that. You know, that's a good question. Supposing the Montreal Protocol had not been passed and we continue to emit uh, or continue to use CFCs, freons, which definitely destroy ozone when they get into the stratosphere. Uh, what would be the effect, let's say, by 2050? I'd have to uh, look it up, or I'd have to consult someone's work on this. I have not done it. Okay. All right, so we're running out of time. Maybe we'll have time for like two more questions. It would but, certainly be more oh. than 4%. Okay. Uh, um, I agree with you. Okay. Um, so where, uh, someone brought this up, and this is a good question. You actually alluded to it in your talk yesterday about how, you know, these, you're glad we invited you because they probably have never seen a skeptic. Uh, where are the, where are young skeptics? Um, you know, as you said, you're the last one of the merchants uh, of the book. And uh, <laughs> I'm not a young skeptic anymore. <laughs> no, no, but where are, where are they? Oh, they're hiding. <laughs> they're hiding. They're hiding because they... Uh, look, I have talked to some young faculty members. They're hiding because uh, they feel that if they go public with their views, they'll never get tenure. Seriously, it's a real problem for young scientists. They can't no longer be very frank. They're being judged by tenure committees that are now being controlled by people who are deriving uh, or are involved, greatly involved in the global warming issue and have been for maybe 10, 20 years. People like yourself. But I have tenure, and I'm a full professor, so I mean, yeah. I, there, no, I can't, there okay no more now. stars can go on my shoulder. So, yeah, uh, but, so what, what motivates me to keep but, you, but you wouldn't give tenure to a young guy who's coming up who says, I don't really believe in global warming, and I've published this paper which shows it doesn't exist. Well, okay, so what about people like me? You're an exception. Uh, I'm, well, what do you mean I'm an exception? Oh, you're pretty good. Well, thank you. All right. <laughs> um, I'm serious. I, I mean, I think your papers are, uh, all right. are sound. I forgive you for everything else you all do. Right, all right, all right. But uh, I think your scientific work is okay. Okay. So, um, okay. So, but but you think the skeptics are out there, but they're afraid to. Yes. Afraid to. Yes. yes. All right. Um, all right. I'm glad I'm no longer a young scientist. Okay. All right. It is two o'clock. Um, you know, I'd love to stay here. I really would. But let's thank Dr. Singer. <laughs> I couldn't see this. I couldn't see this. Yeah.